Welcome to the Book Editor Show. Today we're reviewing the uh, the book Plot and Structure by James Scott Bell. I'm Clark Chamberlain, and it's been said that he was the actual hero that inspired Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces, the man who's been there and come back again, my friend and co-host Peter Turley. Peter, how are you doing today? Um, uh, that, that was quite underwhelming because I was actually um, all thousand faces of <laughs> the hero. So. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, that, that I knew that he had to split it up, you know, to be a thousand faces because it was just too much <laughs> to pin on one man. But uh... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really excited about today's show. Um, this is, I think this is our first s solid book review, I think, is it? It is. I mean, we did, uh, we did look at the seven basic plots last summer um, for, uh, for Chris Boker's book, Booker's book. <laughs> anyway, we should, know, we should know after so, seven shows. We know after seven shows, we should have that down pretty pat. But yeah, this is going to be the, the first of what we hope will be many book reviews that should really help, um, help you figure out what books you should have on your shelf and which ones are really going to help you uh, move your writing forward. Yeah, this is, this is an awesome book. And we chose this one first um, because just because it was so useful, wasn't it? I mean, I think um, we both already had copies of this and had read it back to front several times. <laughs> so it was it was a given that we had to start with this. <laughs> yeah, this is a pretty easy one to, to grab onto. And, and I think this is a fantastic book if you're, I mean, certainly if you're starting writing, but if you already have a manuscript that's finished, you know, being able to go in and see, it has great uh, helps on how to make your manuscript stronger, you know, to find out what's not working and to give you some other good ideas on how to just overall tighten up your book. Yeah, that's, that's a good point that obviously it is, um, I guess essentially it's a writing book, but it, it's, well, it's a writing reference and it is so useful for editing. You know, you can go back and especially when editing is, you know, you, you, you could be cutting so much stuff. It really helps you pinpoint, uh, narrow down on what exactly you want to be cutting. Um, yeah. Obviously, that's not that's not the only, but we'll, we'll get to that later on in the show. But that's that was a, a great one, I think, going back and editing and thinking, you know, what's what's this scene doing? What you know, and learning to break the scene down into its its moving parts and really understand what each of those moving parts did. Yeah, exactly. And um, I just. Uh, I, I just really enjoy this. I mean, like when you, when you just start reading about it and I love his story um, because I think that there are a lot of people out there who are hesitant about writing um, because of this, you know, this, there's this lie. That's what he calls it. The big lie about um, you have to know how, you know, you have to be born a writer. It's not something that can be taught. Like that's the big lie. And I love that, you know, he, he explained that, you know, hearing that over and over in his life and then finally coming to an understanding of how to do this well and how to write well and how to put together story well and what that was and overcoming that and showing that that really isn't the case for uh, for the majority of people. Yeah, that's so true. And I think especially perhaps to amend it a little that you know, it's almost not that it can't be taught, but that, that it's inherent in us anyway. You know, we, that we do fundamentally understand what what makes a story or what contributes a story. Um, you know, we're sitting around fires for thousands of years sort of telling stories or painting on walls and, you know, probably like understanding the three-act structure <laughs> without even realizing that we understood it. I mean, it, say you're in like a, in a, a bar with friends and someone starts to tell you about something that happened to them that day. You can you can almost see like the bits that they embellish and make a little more dramatic and you know and then this happened and then there's a confrontation and it's really interesting to know that it is kind of in us all um, but yeah it's sort of like can it be taught or can it can that just kind of be like unearthed that like natural ability well and certainly you know like natural ability is there. You know, and it can be stronger with one person because, you know, you've got it. Oh, you should have so-and-so should tell you the story because <laughs> they tell the story better. And it's because they know how to punch those moments up and how to add the conflict and how to add the tension to it and bring all of this to bear on the story, which I just think 
he does such a good job of that in this book. And do um, you want to go ahead and we'll just start in with the rest of it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. without further ado. <laughs> without further ado. So um, to start off, uh, I, I want to talk about one other idea he had, and, and this is so true with any of our writing, and the idea that we really want to immerse someone into our, into our story. You know, that if someone's going to take the time to read your book, they need to have that immersive feeling, almost as if um, they called it the fictive dream. So they, this idea that you're going to be in this dreamlike state during this time, because when we dream, it feels real, like, but we're, but we're there, you know, and so that's what you want to have is that feeling at the end of a book that you've been there and you've experienced these things that everyone else in the book has experienced. Because if you don't, you know, if you come to the end of the book and you close it and you're just like, why did I bother <laughs> reading that? I didn't, you know, it had some good information in it or kind of had a couple funny parts, but that was it if they don't have that full immersion, like you're going to miss things. And the, this book is going to help you be able to create that full immersion process. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was, I was sort of like ready to laugh halfway through because I remember just off a, like we had a, a conversation about whether fictive was a, was a real word. Or not. <laughs> real, yeah, I know. <laughs> so fictive <laughs> is someone's real word. It's in the book. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at it. It's definitely, um, <laughs> it's definitely fictive. But, um, no, and, and even in dreaming, you know, we follow the, the same the same conflicts, you know, that we always dream about conflict. They, they still have these these elements. Um, but also I think that that immersion is is the key and sort of having all these elements at play that allow the reader to immerse themselves in a story um, and suspend that disbelief, kind of like you do when you're in a dream where you you don't realize straight away, if ever, that that it was actually a dream. You know, there's it's the rare occasion where you kind of realize that you're you're actually dreaming and you 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 don't really want the reader to be aware that they're reading a book sort of you know especially when they're in the you know the the climaxes and the throes of the story <laughs> <laughs> right yeah it's a suspend the disbelief and keep them there and keep them occupied um he has a system that he developed and he calls it the lock system l o c k and each one of these is a letter that stands for something yeah, that's right. Um, and and this this is one of the great tools within this book um, that can be used even if you're not used to to outlining um, plot or structure or anything like that. This can, if you wanted to sort of give it a have a have a start at outlining and you know sort of dip your toes in, into it, then I think this would be the place to start. Um, so lock it's a it's an acronym uh, L standing for lead. Um, and it's it's mainly that your your lead needs to be strong. Um, they need to be powerful. They, they need to be a well thought out character, um, and which which we all know. But you know that's it's the most important, basically, <laughs> in regard to uh, plotting and structuring your novel. Um, which then moves us into the second one. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about um, objective, uh, uh, yeah. So the objective, you know, is the desire that the the character is going to have to accomplish throughout the story, and we have to have that desire. We have to have that reason. You know, um, when we talked about uh, MRUs, the motivational reaction units, that you're always having a desire, and you're keeping the desire. You know, that they can't achieve the desire right there, but they need to have a desire throughout the story. In every scene, there should be a reason for them interacting with this. And this helps you clear that up, you know, that you can look at each portion and say, is there desire being uh, achieved here? Is there a reason for this to be, to be written? So, um, having that desire and having that strong desire is there. So, for instance, um, new book, Hank Hudson Anubis, which is going to come out in a couple months, like the desire is to... Um, reunite or find family, you know, like it's to rescue the parents. Like that is the big desire through the majority of the book. And so those are the types of things like every decision that Hank is making is based on that desire. And that's a, that's a perfect example. Cause, um, James Scott Bell in, in the, in the book says, um, that when you're considering what the objective is, um, his advice, his advice is that it should be essential to the, the well-being of the lead. Um, so in your case, 
you know, finding and saving his family. It couldn't really be more essential <laughs> to, mm. to Hank's well-being. Um, so that, that's a great objective for any character to have. Mm -hmm. And so you can find these, you know, and you can take a look at it. And that way you can say, is your plot really acting well with the lead character that you're designing? You know, is the story making sense? Because you're going to have a more difficult time of a person reaching that immersion if things don't make sense. And I'm not saying, you know, like you can't write fantasy, like fantasy, science fiction, all these things, they really shouldn't make sense. But we give away, you know, we, we, surrender to our, dis our we surrender our disbelief and we immerse ourselves in those worlds but they still feel like the decisions that people are making are real and that's where that's an important part yeah that and, and that brings us back to the fictive dream you know it's that, that almost even in this fantasy world it still resembles a world the reader knows just just the right amount <laughs> for it for it to make sense within that realm mm -hmm. so yeah, which will take us uh, to the to the sea, which is uh, confrontation. Do you want to take that one? Um, yeah. So um, confrontation. So um, which I, I'm kind of glad. You know, because you, you kind of get sick of hearing the word conflict, <laughs> which is like <laughs> thrown around everywhere. But essentially, it kind of means the same thing. Conf confrontation leads to conflict, or is a form of conflict. Um, it's basically the opposition that the lead will face um, on the path towards their objective. Um, and it's the confrontation, uh, James says, that brings the story to life. Um, so it's, it's that old saying of um, that the a lead, a main character, is only as strong as his opposition. Um, so the, the stronger the confrontation, the, the stronger the lead is going to have to grow to become to obtain the objective, and the sweeter that objective is going to be, um, upon attaining, which will then lead us to the last part of the lock system, which is the knockout. Just a big yeah, knockout right there, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> I love it how he describes it. You know, that if you go to a boxing match, you want to see someone get knocked out. You know, I mean, certainly the, the match can end in a technical knockout where a decision is made by the judges on who scored the most points. But honestly, <laughs> people want to see the knockout. Yeah, and, especially if you paid. <laughs> right. Yeah, especially if you paid to go and sit down and watch the fight. Um, and that's just the same way in the book. We want to see something big happen. We want to see um, the, the explosion, the, the large climax, everything that's that has gone into this. Because if we built this right, you know, we have good lead, you have got a good desire um, to get the objective, and then they've got this great concentration in front of them all the time. Like if we fail at delivering that knockout in the end, then it kind of just all falls apart. You know, having a strong ending is so integral to getting someone to share your story afterward. Cause that's, that's the last moment you have to seal the deal, you know, and say, this is, this is an awesome story <laughs> Like from start to finish. This was amazing. And you got to see the ending of it. Yeah. It's, it's like, um, I'm just going to really work this fictive dream thing right the way through the show. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's almost so like when you're waking up from the dream, it's the, it's the last bit that you remember, isn't it? That stays with you. So like when you, when we dream, we, we feel emotions and you, you wake up with kind of like the taste of the most recent emotion still, still left in you. Um, and that's kind of like the knockout is, isn't it? That's the last thing you take away. And the, the feeling and the resolution and the, the highs and the, the lows, everything that it's made you feel is, is still there. And the bigger that payoff, the, like you just said, the, the greater the shareability or of the, of the story. Right. Because that's, that's what it is. You know, like I've now seen uh, Captain America civil war twice. Um, I'll be seeing it like a third and fourth time this next week, probably, but uh, <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but I'm just excited to talk to people about the show. Like if I've, if they've seen it, I'm excited to sit down and talk about it because the story is so well put together. Everything is there and the ending is huge payoff, you know, like, when you're going into civil war, you're, you're getting exactly what they were selling you out the outside. And that's, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, it, it, whereas, and I've already complained a lot about, uh, <laughs> what's that? I'm going tomorrow. I'm sold. <laughs> yes, you do. You need to go. Absolutely. You need to see this. Um, 
But another movie that uh, that had two superheroes fighting it out had no payoff. Like it was just a terrible ending, and it just made me not care to share the stuff except for saying, "Yeah, that really sucked." <laughs> yeah, and it's so, funny you say that because because of um, the reactions of people that went to to see that. Um, we're talking about Batman v Superman. Um, yep. I didn't go to watch it. Um, and I'm I'm like a huge Superman fan, and I was really, really, really excited about it. Um, and I just didn't bother because of pe- people that I trust around me um, were just so negative about it. And that that's the power of, of word of mouth, isn't it? It really is. And that's what you need to be able to do with your writing. If you're going to ever be able to establish this large tribe of readers and people who are sharing your work, then you have to develop it in a way that it's shareable. You know, and this ending is important. This knockout ending is so important. Yeah, it really, it really is. Um, and I think um, just before sort of moving on, um, I mean, this is especially all of our listeners, is, it's going to be clear anyway, <laughs> but it's um, in the book, he kind of differentiates between plot and structure um, as, because I know, especially starting out, you know, that was a question I had. I sort of wondered, you know, what's the difference? Is it, are they not the same thing? You know, just a different way of saying the same thing. Is it like tautological? Um, but he describes plot as the elements that, that make up the story um, and structure as the timing of those elements. Now, I know that Ray Bradbury um, kind of suggested that I think he was famously an, a non-outliner he didn't outline i think i think this is mentioned in the book actually that might be where i've read this <laughs> um, <laughs> and he said that that plotting was actually just looking back at the footprints in the snow and it's kind of like you only really see the plot once it's been written um this book flies in the face of that and says that you know you can kind of plan those footprints um but i think that distinction of plot as elements and structure as the timing um, it just was was a great way for me to get my head around what was what and you know how I was going to sort of start to put these pieces together. And for myself, you know, and we all have different ways of looking at some of these things, you know, and, and I think it's, they do a really good job in this book, or James does a really good job in this book with that. Um, you know, because I've I've had that same issue. You know, like what what does that mean? And so for me, you know, plot like for a long time that I've looked at plot as those outer problems that come along in the story, and not necessarily like the inner problems that are being driven home. But uh, but the getting into the structures, you know, he talks about two structures in here: um, the three act structure, and then also the is it the mythical structure? Yeah, the mythic structure. Yeah. And so uh, these are a couple of great ways to be able to, to frame in the story and, the, and the talking about that timing and where elements are going to fall into place. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the three-act structure, which basically is a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the things that happen in between there. Like um, He uses the example of the doors. So um, the, the first door that uh, the character that your lead has to walk through is the decision to enter into the main action of the story. And then the second door, and that would lead between the first act and the second act. And then the, the second door is between the second and third act. And that's the point of no return, that they're committed to everything and leading up towards a climax. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting putting them as, like phrasing them as doors, because I know later in the, the book it talks about, um, you know, if, it, if it's missing something and it needs enriching or deepening, he says to kind of have a... A disturbance event that then creates two doors um, as, as a way to kind of figure out where your plot really needs to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, but those doors, I mean, I think essentially they're, they're kind of a way of talking about um, turning points. Um, you know, I think that's maybe how some of us understand them. Um, but it is really interesting because a door kind of suggests choice. Um, that a turning point doesn't really suggest choice to me. And I think it is, it, it prevents you from neglecting character because, you know, the characters I would say do have a choice, you know, as you're going through and you're writing or you're editing and it's important to consider, you know, is this choice or this door um, consistent with, with that particular character? So, you know, it, it kind of like it rewired my brains a little, like <laughs> reading this, uh, this book. 
Well, yeah, because, you know, you, you do. You want to have choice every step of the way, you know, from the beginning to the end, that it needs to be the lead character making the choice to continue on with the story. Um, because what happens when you have what I would call the plot, you know, the, this outer problem coming in and dragging the lead along, that then that's the ones that feel, you know, they don't feel true. And it, it's, it feels mechanical. You know, that this stuff is just happening regardless of whether the lead of your protagonist was there or not. And if you have them faced with choices all along the way that they can choose to stay or go. And we can take a look at uh, Star Wars with Luke Skywalker. Spoiler alert. And, <laughs> and Uncle Die. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's so, I, I'm sorry, I know. <laughs> if a movie is from the 70s, I think you should have had time to take <laughs> But anyway, um, so he makes a decision. Hey, I'm going to stay at home, and I'm not going with you, Ben, because Uncle... Uh, I can't even think what his name is. Lars? Anyway, Aunt, yeah. Lars, it's the last name, Aunt Beru and Uncle Owen. Oh, so yeah. Uncle Owen, <laughs> I'm going to go home and help Uncle Owen on the moisture farm. And Ben's like, all right, that's fine. And then we come back to the, the place. They're going to drop Luke off, and <laughs> Aunt and Uncle are dead. And so now we've got another choice to make. And he makes a choice. Hey, I want to pursue this. I want to learn about the ways of the Force. I want to understand who my father was and all of this. I want to follow you, Ben. And that's that was the choice to move in because he could have still said, you know, what? oh, my goodness, they're dead. Now I've got to take care of the farm. I've got to find out how this happened and, and all of this. That's a choice that he could have made. And so that's what you want to be able to do is set up choices for your character. I want to see that film. <laughs> yeah, you should see it. Like, I don't know if you've heard of Star Wars. Um, so oh, no, I, mean, yeah. I want to see the one where he stays on the farm. <laughs> oh, where he stays on the farm. Yes. Yeah, that would be a good story, you know. <laughs> we could do a fan fiction. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Farmer Luke. <laughs> Where Farmer Luke or Ben takes off on his own. Farmer Luke stays back behind, handles the business, <laughs> creates a creates a farming empire there on Tatooine. So <laughs> but I think all um, along the way. Uh, sorry, go on. Uh, all along the way of your story, though, you want to be presenting choices. Now, clearly, when the reader gets to the end and looks backward, there's only one choice that could have been made all along. You know, like each of those choices made sense. And that's the only choice that could have been made. But you still want to give the feeling of choice. Yeah, that's the... And, and, and like, you know, we don't mean that bit to sound easy because I think that's the, that's the difficult bit, isn't it? To sort of... Where the the upcoming door or turning point is we don't see it. So it's a surprise when it happens, but then once you it's been traveled through, it seems completely inevitable. You're like, Oh, of course that was the way it was going to turn out. And then getting that element of surprise is the, is the real tricky bit, but you know, <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, we'll absolutely get there. So um, were there any other of the structural elements that you wanted to cover? Um, I think maybe to just touch quickly on um, the action-reaction serpent deepening. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the uh, he calls this the four chords of a scene, and I think this is pretty cool. Yeah, that was just... Um, I mean, it, it, essentially, I think if you take anything, take the lock system and, you know, you use that and apply it to something you've written or something you're going to write. Um, but this is just another way to look at, at scenes or the story as a whole. Um, and that is... The first one is is action um so that's something that happens or it's an event and then reaction is simply how that's made the character or characters feel um about the event so it's kind of like and it helps it helps particularly in the writing processes kind of kind of like um beats and ways to know what should logically come next so after an action there's going to be um a reaction to that and then this, the second two portions of these chords, and we've talked about um, action and reaction before, and um, with the motivational reaction units, the MRUs, and I think that is pretty, you know, that we're talking the same thing in both of those, yeah. the, the book and then this, and that's really things that you should uh, definitely put into your toolbox because it's fantastic to be able to use those. 
Um, the second one, uh, or the second two chords are the setup and the deepening. And so the setup, you know, like there are things that you're going to have to do to set up the reader to be aware of or to be prepared for what's coming next. You know, if you've got a, a world where you need to explain a magic system, you know, it has to be a setup so that you can see this taking place and happening. And how do you do that without it being this exp um, exposition that's just super boring, you know, and it's just someone, it, you're just explaining all this stuff as the narrator. And some of the ways that, you know, that he suggests to handle this is that when this is happening that you add in a problem into the scene like you could be talking about the magic system you know with the the, the the teacher and the student but then there could be an argument that's taking place in between this you know that, that, that something else is going on you know that that's adding more tension to that moment so that you have this great scene where you're setting up things to make sense later or preparing it for a later scene that's going to occur but this is still interesting yeah, and uh, that's almost like um, like a, a sleight of hand kind of art of distraction, isn't it? Where there's they're actually giving some kind of exposition, but there's a scene taking place as well, and you almost miss the fact that something is being set up, and then now that say, makes it seem inevitable later down the line. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, the second one, I'm a big um, fan of deepening. And this idea, you know, that you're you're deepening the characters, you're adding in what he calls flavor and spice um, to the characters' lives. But that there should be moments where you're, where you're taking a moment to really deepen the meaning of the character, what the character likes, who the character is. And not just necessarily the protagonist, but it could be secondary characters. It could even, if you're having point of view from the antagonist, all these moments where you can make them be more alive, where that you can engage the reader more with an emotional impact. Um, like, for instance, you know, that the, it's something that the, the character is going through that maybe the reader might go through, and you can target that well. And actually, um, we have the download on our website right now that you can click on that talks about um, being able to engage this, the, emotionally with your reader. And these are some important elements of that is that you've got to take the time to deepen the character in order to do this. It, it doesn't happen in the fight scene. It doesn't happen in the getaway. It doesn't happen in the argument. It is happens in a, in a lull, in a moment that can, you can take a step back and kind of take a breath. Yeah. And then, it's it's the round the campfire moment really isn't it mm -hmm. <laughs> and um i know like we've got a an upcoming show um that where we'll talk more about uh, world building but um it, this this applies to that kind of in my head um that that's like what i immediately think of and it's kind of like the deepening is where you're hinting at something larger you're hinting at a larger world you're hinting at a character's past or you, you know you're making it richer you know there isn't just the plot that you currently in you know there, there was something before and there'll be something after and you know there's there's other stuff all around that just needs to be and i think he refers to it as the spice because you know it should be used lightly and you mm -hmm. know just hinted at um but it's but it's an essential part really isn't it you know if if, if you don't want something to seem entirely 2d Right, exactly, because you're just developing the full immersive experience, and this is part of that. You know that, that there's in in the dream world, in <laughs> in the fictive dream, <laughs> you've got to have those moments, right, where you're actually experiencing something, you're feeling something, you're smelling something, you're you're engaging other senses, and you're deepening the world that you're sitting in, and that's that's what it's all about, right there. Yeah, um, and I I think. I think that unlocked the, the the real big takeaways from this book. But it was a it was a great read. I, I like I come back to this like loads. It's one of I'm not a big fan of, you know, like scribbling in books and highlighting them and everything. <laughs> but this one, like I had to. Like um there's so many yeah, useful nuggets and rules and exercises um that you know you, you're going to want to highlight it in your hand when you go through this book. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, talking about exercises. At the uh, the end of the book, there's a great one on writing your back book cover. 
and <laughs> coming up with that and trying to really see if you understand what your story is about. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, and um, an essential. And I, I was in a, a lesson on, I was learning about script writing and um, it, that, that was like hammered home then that kind of if you, if you can't, if you're unable to kind of have a one sentence pitch or a back cover blurb, um, then you've not nailed down your idea enough to start writing. Um, and he says that, you know, as a little advice for people who don't like outlining, um, then he, he just gives two pieces of advice if you want to do a mixture of both, which is to use the lock system and to write a back cover. Because by simply doing that, you know at least that the basic elements of the story couldn't, can work. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to, I totally forgot, I wanted to bring up one other thing in here and he's got a section of uh, problems and cures. Um, to, and I think this is really good, especially for those of you who have a manuscript done, who are ready to take that editing process to the next level. And one of them I think is just fantastic. And it's the idea about curing the flat scene. You know, you've got these scenes in your book um, that just are kind of dull and, and not much is happening. And so uh, he suggests that you read through the scene until he, you find what he calls the hot spot. And once you've found the hot spot, you circle that. You know, that's where, where this scene is actually has something of interest to it. And then you start working backward from the hot spot, sentence by sentence, and you start removing everything that's not related to the hot spot and anything that's unnecessary you just get rid of it and then all of a sudden you've shortened that scene up to where it's just hitting the important part the hot spot of that and if you don't have a hot spot in a scene then you remove the scene entirely like if it doesn't have a point of being there then it needs to go yeah and i mean like the, the subtitle to the book is uh, techniques and exercises for crafting a plot that grips readers from start to finish so the main the main sort of angle he's trying to take here is engagement. And by by taking away those non-essential parts of scenes, um, you're decreasing the chance that the reader's gonna disengage with the story because you kind of just left with the, the best bits. And he even goes as far as says goes as far as saying um, that if your scene doesn't have a hot spot, the scene itself should probably be cut. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's just if if it doesn't do anything for the story, that's been brutal, it isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, and it is, and it hurts, right? You know, but um, this this has to happen. And also, I would say that this is the reason why you should have an editor working with you because you're close to it, and you say, "Well, I know that it doesn't really have a hot spot, but it's important because of this." because really it's important because the author loves it. <laughs> it's hard to get rid of it, you know, because you've put effort into it and it's something that you care about. But really, if you can have another set of eyes that says, you know what, it, your story will be stronger if you remove this entirely. Like it's, it's, it's slowing down the plot. It's, it's taking, it's that plot hole, you know, that's bumping the person back out of the uh, dreamlike state that you've created. Sorry, the, the fictive dream with which you've created. <laughs> yeah and um and that sort of you know to not just hot spot but he, he also talks about inner uh, tension doesn't he and um and outer tension um and you know if the scene is missing these hot spots or these the, the the tension and like you just said sometimes it can take that other pair of eyes to to maybe be like you know this scene is flat or it's falling flat you know, maybe you felt excited writing it. Maybe you could see the tension, but it's not its not clear enough or there's too much in here that are, that's diluting the tension. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And because that's what you just want. You want to have a strong book that hooks a person from the beginning, takes them through to the end, gives them an emotional impact at the end, that, that what he calls the knockout, and it's going to make them want to share it. And that's, that's what you want. And, you know, unless you don't want that, you know, if you want to have a book that's, <laughs> that's boring that no one wants to read, I mean, you know, you could not do this stuff. Maybe you want to write about moisture farmers on Tatooine, then. 
<laughs> I, I think, uh, yeah, you've got at least one. I'll, I would read that book too. So you've got two people there. <laughs> and I think there could be a lot of hot spots on Tatooine. Yeah, <laughs> see what uh, you did there. Uh, yeah, I see what I did. <laughs> the desert, if you haven't seen Star Wars. So, <laughs> so all right. Uh, do you want to? You have anything else to add on this? This has been a, a lot of information here on this book. Yeah, the, only that if you, you know, if you want to buy one <laughs> writing reference book um, to help you understand plot, then then start with start with this one. It's a, it's a great one. It really is. And again, uh, this is Plot and Structure by James Scott Bell. You should be able to find it at any of your local bookstores. Of course, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, if you're online. Uh, it does have an ebook as well as print. And if you like to do the highlighting and things, be like Peter, get the, get the physical copy of it for sure. Yeah, so it's a must. <laughs> well, if you like the show, please leave us a uh, review on iTunes, a plus on Google, or a like on YouTube. And if you're an editor who would like to be a guest on the show, stop by thebookeditorshow.com and drop us an email. And remember on there, stop by the Book Editor Show because we, like I said, we've got this fantastic um, worksheet that you can download to help figure out exactly how you can engage your reader better emotionally. And uh, it's absolutely free. You just come on there and it's right on the front page. You can click and download that. So um, I'm Clark Chamberlain and for my co-host, Peter Turley, keep writing, keep learning and build a better book.